Good morning and welcome to our online worship service for Carmichael Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Bill Brown and we're continuing on with number 18 in our series of the gospel in the books of Moses. We started from John chapter 5 and verse 46 where Jesus said that Moses wrote of him. And we're also going to continue on in looking at the ceremonies. This is part four of our looking at the ceremonies of the tabernacle. Actually, this is only a portion of the whole day of the ceremonies uh, that are involved. And we are going to look specifically at the year of Jubilee. You'll find that in Leviticus chapter 25, starting with verse 8 to verse 22. Uh, prior to that, of course, is the Sabbath year. And then this, of course, the year of Jubilee is a Sabbath year, a sacred year. Now, when we begin to look at this year of Jubilee, we're only going to take those first uh, three verses from eight and nine and ten. So let's read about the year of Jubilee in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 8, 9, and 10. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, in the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And ye shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. Now, this really gets exciting when you begin to look at it, and I think I'm sure that the Israelites were certainly excited to come upon the year of Jubilee. In this particular series, and this message, I should say, on the year of Jubilee, we're going to be looking at the proclamation of that year, how it was proclaimed, what was proclaimed, just simply the proclamation of that year. Then we're going to look at the power of it. How did it influence their lives? What took place that made a difference for them? Then we're going to look at the promise that's made in that year of Jubilee, and then we're going to look at the problem, and it's not with the year of Jubilee, it's with man in particular. First of all, we're going to be looking at the proclamation, and we're going to look at uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, but before I mention that, let me just give you the fact that these instructions, of course, were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Find that in the very first verse of Leviticus 25. In fact, let me take you back to that just so you see it, um, that this was to be like a year like no other. The whole year was to be made hollow or set apart or sanctified from all of the other years. This was, as it's called, the year of Jubilee. It was a year of proclaiming liberty to all of Israel through all the land of Israel. And it was announced on the Day of Atonement with the trumpets of Jubilee. You know, the priest had to keep a calendar and he must be strict in maintaining the law and the keeping of the law for all of Israel. So that's why you see it was on such and such a date of such and such a month that this was proclaimed. This year did not happen in a vacuum. This day did not happen in a vacuum. It was quite a celebration, which included, as we said already, that Day of Atonement. And there were various ceremonies throughout the day that we could make mention of. And I will briefly, just to mention the scapegoat, the ashes of the red heifer, and of course, very uh, many more than just that. Every one of those ceremonies were to be strictly kept, and the original orders followed to the details. They could not change anything. Why? Because it would change the meaning or it would change the lesson that God was using to teach each succeeding generation about sin, about salvation, and about service. 
Here, of course, it's about redemption and restoration. You know, you think about it, he used seven chapters of the book of Leviticus to instruct them about their redemption. The whole book of Leviticus, actually the name of it, has to do with being a book of explanation. Yes, it's hard to read sometimes all of the details that are there, but once you begin to see the picture of grace and mercy that's drawn throughout its pages, you will begin to be delighted to find those things and see Jesus and the gospel. The ceremony was in fact a time of preaching the gospel. It looked forward to the coming of the Messiah and fulfilling every part of that ceremony. It proclaimed loudly with those silver trumpets for all to hear that this was the day of redemption and the day of restoration. It was an announcement that your service and your slavery has ended. That's why we threw up there Luke chapter 4, and you can read from verse 16 through 21. We'll only pick up starting in verse 18, where Jesus, after he came into the uh, temple, he picked up the scriptures and purposely read from this portion of scripture. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, listen to this, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He's referring to the year of Jubilee. And in fact, you go a little bit further down to verse 21. What does he say? He closed the book and he began to say unto them, once he sat down this day, is this scripture? fulfilled in your ears. The Messiah had come. The year of Jubilee had commenced. He was preaching the acceptable year of the Lord. The day of redemption and the day of restoration for all of Israel had come. Of course, all that Christ did, he satisfied every demand of the law of God, every bit of the justice of God. How could he do so? Because he was both God and man. He could suffer for us. He could suffer in our place. And he is most definitely proclaiming liberty. Imagine the interest of every poor and impoverished person who had to hire themselves out because of their debt. They would have been looking forward to this day and this ceremony. They would await the blast of the trumpet and rejoice in the proclamation of the debt that was canceling all of their, or proclamation of their debt being canceled and that liberty was now theirs. A man could become so poor, he could not support himself and he might sell himself as a slave. Now, it was always, if it was to a Jew, it was always they were to be treated as a hired servant, uh, not a bond slave. But on this day, no matter the position, when the trumpet would blow, his debt was canceled, and he was liberated and able to return to his home. Anyone could be redeemed, but either he must do it or a kinsman must pay his debt before that day of Jubilee. But if that could not happen, that day of Jubilee meant freedom. In fact, look what it says in Leviticus 25, starting in verse 47. It says, And if a sojourner or a stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself into the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family. After that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem redeem him, or any that is nigh, notice that, of kin. The kinsman redeemer is part of this story of the year of Jubilee. Um, and he may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. And he shall reckon with him that bought 
him from the year that he was sold to him unto the year of Jubilee, and the price of his sale shall be according unto the number of years, according to the time of a hired servant, shall it be with him. Again, how rich and wonderful that you find out about the kinsman redeemer, just a little bit of it, but it's here in this story. It isn't until we come to the book of Ruth that we find the romantic picture of redemption by the kinsman redeemer. Well, I'm here to tell you that Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He became a man. He became made like unto us yet without sin, that he might pay our redemption and restore unto us all that was lost in the fall. You see, we could say that we sold our birthright. We were deceived by the devil and have no hope and certainly no ability to redeem what we lost. We could not restore liberty to ourselves nor to anyone else. But the year of Jubilee announced that another had taken up our cause. The second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, took upon himself our flesh. And when he read that scripture, he was indeed announcing your liberty the year of Jubilee. Let me tell you a little bit about not only the proclamation of it, but the power of that day. That day impacted their economy and their lives and their plans. Now it was to happen, as we already read, every 50 years. The year that it happened would determine the value of the possessions and even the value of the person's that were hired out for service. The value of a possession or the person's servitude depended upon how many years remained until the year of Jubilee. More years, you got more money. The fewer years, you got fewer money. Why is that? Because once that year year of Jubilee rolled around, that property or that person was no longer a slave or a hired servant or in the possession of whoever purchased it. It went back to the original owner. But in the 50th year, again, all property and persons were returned or set free. They were liberated from their death. That, of course, was a Sabbath year. And one of the things that's interesting about this and the power of it, mm, no field could be planted, nor could it be pruned nor could any of it be harvested. The land was to have a year of rest. Let me show you in Leviticus 25 and verse 11. It says that a jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap with that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undress. So even though you hadn't gone out and done anything, you couldn't go out still and produce. In fact, the laws for this land were there very clear. Go back to verses three and four, and you'll see where he says, six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land a Sabbath for the Lord. You see, this was the Lord's land. And these people were just people who were there by God's permission. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. You are a steward of what God has placed in your care. And this was one of the rules. Now, any property, the land, could be sold but it must be returned to the original owner so that the original inheritance given to each one of the tribes could never be removed from that tribe. This assured that the inheritance belonged to the tribe that God gave it to. It could not be lost or stolen. Look at verse 28 of Leviticus 25. He says, but... If he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that it bought it until the year of Jubilee. And in the Jubilee, it shall go out and he shall return unto his possession. It's interesting 
houses that were built by men and were in the city must be redeemed within the first year after it had been sold. Or if it was not redeemed within that first year, it was lost forever. That house purchased was not affected by the year of Jubilee if it was in a city. But homes that were built out on the land, out in the rural area, were not under this exclusion, and they must be returned along with the land. So houses in the city of a Levite, you would think they would be sold and never returned. No, the house in the, of the city of the Levites must be returned because the cities were an inheritance of the Levites and it could not be lost. The reason why I'm saying that, you used to look at the proclamation of it and then the power of it. It dictated the value of the property, how it would be sold, and the value of the possessions and even the people for hire. And by the way, the priests would set the value according to that year of Jubilee, and it could not be changed. He set the value based on the years uh, until the year of Jubilee. Now, I'm going to kind of combine the last two parts together Although you'll see, we want to look first at the promise and the problem, but there's not going to be a definitive line between the two. But you have to look at the promise. I mean, the day of Jubilee, again, was like no other. Well, this day preached Jesus like no other. We see him and we have seen him already in the story of the scapegoat. We've seen him in the ashes of the red heifer. We see him in the incense of the altar. We see him in the Passover lamb. We see him in the building of the tabernacle and the materials. And we've seen him in the furniture of the tabernacle. We've seen him in some of these ceremonies. And now we see him in the trumpets of Jubilee. These trumpets were acknowledging that Jehovah is king. He would provide and we needed to honor his Sabbath and that year of rest. Look with me at the promises in these ceremonies and see in particular what we can in Leviticus 25, verses 20 and 21. And he says, And if ye shall say, What shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increase, then will I command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. The day you think about it of atonement, the day that the year of Jubilee would be proclaimed, began with that high priest laying his hands upon two goats, one taken before the Lord and slaughtered, one killed and his blood sprinkled. The other would uh, also atone for Israel's sins by being led out uh, into the wilderness and the sins would be borne away, never to be seen again. The trumpets would blow and that year of Jubilee would begin. You and I have heard the trumpets of the gospel of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now we await the another trumpet, the trumpet that will announce his second coming. That day will be a day of complete and absolute restoration and even redemption for every child of God. All that you and I lost in the fall through Adam, every bit of it will be restored plus more. All of the things that we have had or used to have and then were marred by sin will again be ours. There is an inheritance, if you remember, laid up for us and that will be restored that day. Jesus is then the one who will rule. He is the one who sets the value upon us and that's his love that he set upon us. He paid the price for our full, complete redemption. You have to think about it. That year of Jubilee reminds us of the promise that Paul wrote about in Romans chapter 8, verses 21, 22, and 23, where he says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of 
corruption into the glorious liberty. There it is, folks, the year of Jubilee. He promised it. He preached it. We will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and prevaileth in pain again together until now. And not only they, just like the land of Israel groaned under the curse of sin, so does this world. But one day, folks, it and we will all be made new. Not only they, he says, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, the down payment. Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, what? The redemption of our body. The day that mortality will put on immortality. The day that corruption will put on incorruption. That's the year of Jubilee. You see, the Christian does not look for riches in this world. We have a promise that the trumpet at the second coming of Jesus Christ will blow, and it is then that you and I will receive our riches and glory. It is then that we will rest from all of our struggles. It is then that there will be no more work in planning. There will be no more work in maintenance, no more sowing, no more pruning. Can you trust God with your life and with your eternity? Can you wait for that day, the year of Jubilee? Well, I said there's the proclamation, there's the power, there's the promise, but here's the problem. The problem is this. It's us. Israel had a problem. Israel did not obey this law. In fact, in looking back through it, I wonder if they ever obeyed this law. By ignoring this law, Israel became the slaves of their enemies. Well, I'm going to tell you, when you and I do not preach Christ, when we as a New Testament church do not proclaim the gospel of liberty from the slavery of sin, we leave people impoverished and in slavery and without hope, and we ourselves will become poor, much like the church in the book of Revelation that had lost their first love. You see, this is the, is the law that Israel broke when God sent that king of the Chaldees, to remove them from their land, and he allowed them to take her Sabbaths. Look with me at Second Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 21. When he talked about the fact that the Chaldees besieged Israel, took that land and captured all of them. He says, all this was to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until, notice this, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she de lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and 10 years. You see, just like Israel, we cannot afford to be silent and not trust God when it comes to preaching of the gospel. They should have followed through and kept that year of Jubilee. Look further with me in back at Leviticus, this time chapter 26, verses 27 and verse 28. He gives them another promise. And he says, if you will not for all this hearken to me, but walk contrary to me. Then what did he tell Israel? I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chasten you seven times for your sins. If you go on and read further in that same chapter, Israel's disobedience and the actions you see from Daniel and Jeremiah and the Lamentations were all foretold in this particular passage, Leviticus 25, or excuse me, chapter 26, verses 33 through 35, where he says, And I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then shall the land, ah, enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land. 
Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest because it did not rest in your Sabbath when you dwelt in it. See, they disobeyed. There was the problem. They didn't trust. The very reason why Israel was enslaved by the Chaldees was because she would not be obedient and trust God for that year of Jubilee. We allow ourselves, even as Christians, to act like slaves when we do not act upon like we believe the promises of God. They could not sow, prune, or gather. Not even the wild crops were available for them. They had to trust God. And you know what? They had to trust God not only for themselves, but even for their animals. They could not sow for their animals. They had to trust God. Well, God had already promised. He said, listen, if you will do what I'm telling you to in that sixth year, I'll give you three years worth. I will absolutely best give you the best and you'll be able to survive. But instead of trusting God, they failed to follow him. They chose their own path and their own means. When you do this, you turn any possible liberty into enslavement. Even if you are already set free by the gospel of Jesus Christ and have been, you can act like a slave if you ignored trusting God for your provisions. They ignored the preaching of the trumpets. They ignored the command of God to repent and believe and go on about their business. They wanted to provide their own righteousness. They wanted to make their own way into heaven. Well, let me tell you, no man is sufficient to the task. You and I, just like them, are sinners. The day of Jubilee is not about us, but it's about Jesus. He is our near kinsman. He paid the price when we could not. He was able and he was willing to pay the price. He was willing to do what no sinful man could do. Jesus was the trumpet making the announcement. He was the one who declared it in Luke when we read it there, the redemption that God has provided. He was the Lord's goat. He was the scapegoat upon whom our sins were cast. Jesus was the Passover lamb whose blood made atonement and reconciliation for God's elect. Jesus is the one who is calling for you to come and labor no more for your own righteousness. Come, the year of Jubilee is proclaimed. Come and find rest. He is your Sabbath. Quit trying to establish your own righteousness and make your rest on him. Depend upon him and no other. Trust in his righteousness and not your own. I just simply want to remind you the year of Jubilee. There was an announcement, a proclamation, and Jesus did the same thing when he said this, I am right now fulfilling this. I am preaching the acceptable year. The power of it, man, it affected every bit of their lives, even their economic, their hired servants, everything. The promise, do it and I'll bless you. Don't do it and I'm going to get after you. The problem is, just like us today, the power of the flesh. We fail to trust him. But if we fail to trust him, the cost, just like it was for Israel, is way too high. Come and trust him. Do you have the faith to trust him? The year of Jubilee has been proclaimed. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the liberty for your soul is in him. May God bless you. Come and find freedom and liberty in Jesus Christ. Amen.